Hello everyone and welcome to the first annual live Very Morse Garden Get Together. I'm Rebecca Sears. And I'm Tracy. Jen. We're so excited to have you with us today to talk about all things gardening. We've got an exciting day planned. We're going to talk about tips and tricks. We're going to meet with all types of people from across the country to talk about what they're doing with gardening today. And we're going to share with you some new tools that we're launching on fairymorse.com. Today, we're also excited to share with you that we're making a $5,000 pledge to the garden movement, uh, the Million Gardens movement, which is all about bringing the, the practice and the education of gardening to people all across the country. They are also having a plant a seed day today, where with every 10,000 pledges, they'll donate $10,000 of a grant to a nonprofit. So definitely check them out as well. And we're also offering a 15% off on our website today for all the spring gardens. That is true. There. Yeah. So definitely check that out. It's a limited time offer uh, that we're bringing today in, in honor of the first day of spring. Which is so exciting. The first day of spring is the best day of the year. It is. So I personally love the first day of spring because it really gives a sense of renewal and the sense of hope and this idea that pretty soon there'll be green things coming up from the ground. At least here in, in, northeastern, yes. uh, in the northeastern U.S., we definitely look forward to that. What are you looking forward to this year when it comes to gardening? Um, this is actually my favorite part of the year because this is the part of the year where you're thinking of all the stuff that you want to garden and That's you're true. making all your plans. Um, you have probably started seed starting, but if not, we can help you with that. And it's just thinking about all the things that could grow and that, you know, it's later in the season when you start thinking of like, I grew too much or not. <laughs> I love the anticipation when it comes to the planning portion of gardening because you really have the chance to imagine and really think about what you're interested in growing, what gets you excited, what do you want to try that's different this year yes. as well. So the planning part of gardening is really a lot of fun. Yes. Yes. So today, again, we're going to be taking you to different guests across the country. And we're going to start with our friend, Megan Gilger, who's coming to you all the way from Michigan. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Megan. Thanks, Rebecca and Tracy, for having me today. I am Megan Gilger of The Fresh Exchange, and I am located here in Leelanau County, Michigan, and I am growing in zone 5B, 6A. So we're kind of like on the edge. Uh, so it's always kind of an interesting place. One area of our garden is a little bit of a microclimate, so we can kind of play around with growing certain things. So it's a lot of fun to live here, but we are still deep in prepping. We are not into growing things outside just yet. So it is. we still have snow on the ground. It should be gone in a few weeks, but you never know when a snowstorm can hit in Northern Michigan in the spring. So it is a very normal time to still be growing seedlings and doing things like this. So that's why they're here hanging out with me today. I'm so excited to teach with you guys today. I am going to be helping you determine your garden size and how to get started. So garden size is really important. In fact, I think that it may be one of the most important things for most gardeners. Sometimes we get so excited about our gardens that, and we get these seed catalogs and we're just so, so excited to check these things out, to look at them, to try new things. And I get it. I fall prey to it every single year. And I always regret something. Last year, I planted over 40 tomato plants and that was way too many. And so I don't recommend that. <laughs> but even as somebody who knows these rules, it can still happen. But I'm hoping these rules will help you today determine a size that makes you feel successful. Because as I always say to anyone, smaller is always better. So if you're starting to dream big, let's use these rules to scale back to determine what is right so we feel the most successful. I am all about helping people feel successful in the garden and I want it to feel approachable and easy. And the best way to do that is to determine the proper size. So here are some things to ask. First of all, what is the actual amount of space in room that you have available to you? Whether you have a patio or a balcony, or maybe you have a small backyard or a community garden, it doesn't matter. You could even live on 15 acres like me. It doesn't matter the size but determining what is actually available to you is key. So if you, for instance, have live in a suburb area and you have a, you know, backyard that maybe is like, you know, a thousand square feet or so that, that you want to work with, that's a good amount of space to work with. You can do a lot. And we love seeing this and so many of our other followers and gardeners and what they're doing. And a lot of them make use of these spaces. 
But just because you have that space available doesn't mean that you have to use all of it but it's good to determine what space you actually will be using. This doesn't mean you have to have beds in already. You can do all sorts of things, but determining that space that you're gonna use and what you actually can do with it is key. So this can be harder, the bigger space you have because you're gonna to wanna to fill it up. But I'm telling you now, you might wanna start small. The next thing is, is your family size. Family is not, <laughs> you know, how many kids do you have? It can be you and a partner, you and a roommate. It can just be you and your dog doesn't matter. It can be you and your parents, whatever it may be, your, your family size is important because this tells you how much food you actually will eat. This also tells you what your family actually eats, taking really close note of what you eat in your family and what is being consumed in your house. What are some of the things and the amounts that you're actually consuming day to day? Understanding the family size and what you actually eat is really key to understanding what type of garden and the amount of space that you're going to actually use to grow the food that you want to be having in your kitchen. So you don't want to, you know, overplant kale if you're not actually eating kale, or if you, um, or if your family is, you know, for us, I have two kids and my husband, and so we have we eat quite a bit of food. <laughs> And so we need a lot more space to grow our garden and to do everything. But also a note of that is that you don't have to supply all of your own food. So you can always start small, grow a few things that you guys love. You know, if your kids or you personally love strawberries, maybe this is a year to to start into strawberries and you're going to need space for that. So you're going to be able to determine the actual size you'll need by choosing some of the food that you want to be consuming in your home. Next is the amount of time that you have available to you. Now you may be saying, Megan, <laughs> you know, I want to spend all my time in the garden. Well, or you may be saying, I don't have any time at all. <laughs> Great news. You're, the amount of time can be the one major thing that can determine whether or not you're successful in the garden. Being really honest about the amount of time that you spend in your garden is really important. So if you are somebody who's like, you know, I got maybe an hour or two hours during the week that I really can dedicate to this, maybe like 15 minutes checking in, doing a little bit of weeding every evening in the summer, or, you know, I also travel on the weekends or I travel for work. So what am I going to do? I only have really like an hour to two hours a whole week that I could spend in my garden. That's totally okay. You can still have a garden. And in fact, just having the right garden is all you need. So just having maybe two four by eight boxes, you're gonna do a lot in terms of food production in a small amount of space, or maybe you just grow in like these grow bags that Barry Morse has that are really great. These are five gallon bags. We're gonna talk about these more in a minute, but this is a great way to expand your garden in small ways and make use of small spaces. So without a deep investment. So you won't feel so bad if you know you get really busy or you're traveling or something like that, if you have this lower investment into bag, doing bags and things like that in your garden, there's lots of ways that you can do that. Sorry, I spilled a little water. <laughs> so the amount of time is super important. And I tell people all the time, looking at my garden, my garden is part of my work. It's what I do. So part of my time into my work is also spent in my garden. So I can spend 10 to 12 hours a week out in my garden very easily without a problem. And because it's also part of what I do for my work. But if I didn't do this, I would have a much smaller garden. And in fact, I probably only have six, four by eight beds and I would keep it pretty small for our family size. So next level of experience. I think we can get really, you know, out of perspective on what our experience is. And meaning like you may have more experience than you think you do. You're going to undervalue many times what your experience is in something. I do it all the time. Like I definitely would say I am not like a master of this at all. I'm continually learning as part of the gardening process. So, but you can also determine the things that are really, you know, strong suits of your gardening experience. But if you are brand new to gardening, the good news is, is starting small is still going to be your key. So you're not going to want to necessarily think about seed starting this year inside. Maybe you're going to want to buy starts. You can, you know, also be thinking about 
really easy to grow things. And by doing this in a smaller space, maybe one four by eight bed this year, and then the next year you add another, and the next year maybe you add another, or maybe you don't. Either way, you can have a very successful garden in no matter your experience level if you're really, really paying attention to what sort of plants and space are best for your time and experience level. Finally, what you will actually grow. So like I was saying earlier about strawberries, strawberries, for instance, are going to be very, they're going to spread, they're going to move as part of what they are. So you're going to want to have a space that allows you space for that. So if you're planning on doing strawberries this year, you may want to think about that. If you're planning on growing cucumbers, you're going to need to find a way to trellis them. So, and they're going to need a space to grow that trellises. So how are you going to do that? All these certain things are going to come into play, but choosing what you will grow based upon your experience level, the amount of time that you have, things like that can all be helpful determiners in what is the right space for you and for your garden so that you feel successful. You don't feel overwhelmed, which is key. <laughs> and you can have a lot of fun through the process and not feel like it's a big job on your shoulders. And remember, you can always go and buy things from local farmers and things like that. Or it's also a great way to connect and find new plants that you may be interested in by going to the farmer's market and seeing the plants there, you know, for sale or even just for that you can eat and cook with. You know, trying new things can be helpful in understanding the things that you're seeing in seed catalogs or that are for sale in seed catalogs. So this is all really helpful information in determining the right size. So next is how do I get started? What are my options? So when we're talking about the garden, we, in the size of our garden, we want to also think about, okay, if we have the space available to us, we want to grow certain things. What type of garden space is right for us? Meaning how are we going to grow things? Are we going to use a container? What kind of container? Is it going to be a raised bed? Is it going to be a grow bag? Is it going to be a, um, you know, just in-ground beds? You know, what are the different options that you want to play with? You can even do, you know, planters on your porch. You can do all sorts of things. There's so many options. It's a matter of figuring out what is right for you, what is right for your space. Some of the ways that I like to tell people to think about it is when we're talking in-ground and we're talking containers of any kind, whether that's a raised bed, grow bag, or a planter box or whatever it might be, there's two main things. I always say, if you want, if you're not sure about your soil, you don't want to mess with playing with like figuring out your soil. Sometimes you're always going to have to figure it out in some way, but to begin, it's really, really nice to have a container where you fill it with the soil that you want that has all the proper nutrients, everything in it. And you can just go. It's usually the easiest way to get started. But if you're investing for a longer period of time, you may want to think about a in-ground bed. In-ground beds are going to be a lower investment in terms of materials, but they're going to be a longer <laughs> tail on making sure the soil is right. Nailing it year after year is going to take time. So I always suggest to people that if you're wanting to get going right away and have a lot of success early on, start with a raised bed or two. Or like I said earlier, the grow bags are really great. What's so awesome about that is you have a low investment in, and because they're usually pretty inexpensive, you fill them with soil, you have a lot of control. It's great for growing so many things, okay? It aerates the soil really well. There's a lot of good airflow, a lot of good moisture retention. It's really an awesome way to grow, even if you're a beginner, even if you just have a patio. I suggest it all the time to people, especially as beginners that just want to get started and try something because you're going to feel a lot of success and it's a really simple way to kind of get your hands dirty, so to speak, in the garden. Now, maybe some common questions that you may be having as you were listening to all this are going to be like, what is actually best for beginners to grow? So this is probably one of the most common questions I get. And I love this question because it means as a beginner, you're looking to be successful. You're looking to make sure that this experience is exciting and you feel like you've, you're really invested in it. So what I want to make sure is that we're growing things that we're going to see the results from that we're not going to have a ton of problems with, and that they're not going to take a lot of time. Some of these things 
Ozzy are going to surprise you because they're things that maybe we don't necessarily think of as easy to grow things. But some of the top ones I always tell people are potatoes. Once again, potatoes are really easy to grow in grow bags. You put them in, you layer the soil up and with some compost or really great soil as they grow. And then by the end of it, you're dumping the bag out and you got this harvest. And it's really, really fun, especially if you have kids. I highly suggest that. I also don't suggest beginners necessarily grow tomatoes. They can overrun your garden. If you don't know what you're doing with them, they can usually bring in a lot of disease and it's a lot of maintenance. And as the seeds start, it can be really challenging. There, it, it is a more challenging plant, surprisingly. But if you still want to make salsas and things like that, instead think about tomatillos. You grow two of them, you always have to have a pair, but they're really easy to grow and they're really fun and you still get salsa, which is awesome. And then it's gonna surprise you, but beans and peas are also really fun. Lettuces, Swiss chard, uh, onions are really exciting, and even garlic, which you have to plant you know, in advance, but it's really rewarding. And they offer a lot of great companion options into your garden so that you can help uh, deter pests and things like that. So there's so many great vegetables and herbs as well. So the herbs that I always suggest in flowers are Cosmos, Zinnias, uh, Marigolds. Those are some really easy, and sunflowers are really easy to grow in the garden. But then also you may want to think about uh, for herbs, uh, cilantro can be very challenging. It's actually a cold weather herb, but you could think about chamomile and basil is actually a little challenging, but it can be really easy. I think some of the varieties like uh, Tulsi or holy basil is much easier, even Thai basil. Um, lemon, uh, lemon verbena is really easy to grow. Actually, shiso and um, oregano, rosemary, any of those are actually quite easy to grow within your garden beds. So, and I always love growing nasturtium. It's an awesome, beautiful plant that offers a lot of benefits in the garden and you can use it in your salads. So there are so many benefits to all these plants and it's a lot of fun to grow all of them. Many of them also can just be started just from seed directly in your garden, which is even better. The next question is as a family of four, what do I, what kind of garden should I grow? And I think this is, there's so many family of fours, there's so many parents that are getting into gardening now it seems that this is also a common question that I get. And I think a good garden size for a small family is about four, four by eight beds. I think that's the perfect size. You can go up to six, but if you do four, four by eight beds with some pots or grow bags that have potatoes and other things in them, I think you're really, really going to enjoy your garden. It isn't too big, but you can trellis, you can do like a nice trellis between them and create nice experiences and height and and attractive features of all the plants growing and everything. And I think you're really, really going to enjoy that kind of space. I hope that this has been super helpful. It has been such a pleasure to be here with you guys today. Thank you again for having me. I'm going to go back to you now, Rebecca. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Megan. Those are some really helpful tips, especially for first time gardeners who are trying to think through how much space they have and what they want to grow. So for those of you just joining us, you're joining live our first annual Ferry Morse Garden Get Together. We're so happy to be joining you on this first day of spring. And, um, you know, in thinking about planning a garden, I know you've spent some time, Tracy, thinking about what you want to grow this Always. year. Yes. yes. So why don't you share that? Um, so I tend to not do as many vegetables because I have young children who like... Uh, to not eat vegetables. <laughs> so um, I tend to focus on flowers. I have a perennial garden that I started from seed mm. about two years ago. So that's like starting to come up, which is awesome. Um, purple cone flowers and bachelor buttons and mm. things that really attract butterflies because I can make a cutting garden out of it, which is just instant gratification, which is great. Um, and then I also have these really epic window boxes that I'm hoping to fill with like some sort of like spilling flower. I really like nasturtium. I think they're going to be okay. Nasturtium actually, well, that'll do great in a window box. Um, so nasturtium, for those of you who are not familiar with nasturtium, it's really an amazing plant because mm. not only does it make beautiful flowers that tend to have a trailing habit, so they cascade, but you can also eat the flowers. 
That is fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they almost have a spicy, almost like little wasabi flavor to them. Yeah. And they, it's funny because the seed, I know seeds as I work for Fairy Morse and um, the seeds look like peas. And so I make my kids plant them because they're gigantic. So they can just pluck them in the soil. Um, and that's an exciting thing. And the foliage is actually my favorite part. It looks like uh, kind of like mini lily pads. And they just grow so beautifully out there. So I'm going to have it trailing up, trailing down. My husband's going to love it. It's going to be everywhere. Yeah, that's a beautiful plant. And it's a fun one that you can actually, you know, really eat the flowers. That's unusual. Yeah. So what do you actually like to grow in your garden? So um, I love to vegetable garden and I love to cook. So that's probably a part of it. But I grow lots of tomato plants, lots of pepper plants, uh, hots and bell peppers as well. And pretty much, you know, if you can name the vegetable, I like to grow it. But um, I especially love tomato plants and trying different varieties because you might not really realize this, but tomatoes actually have different flavor profiles. You can have a really acidic tomato or a very sweet tomato, one that's great for slicing on sandwiches, one that's great for processing into sauce. So it's amazing just with one plant type, all the different things and all the different uses that it has. I lied. We actually do grow cherry tom tomatoes at our house because my six-year-old loves them and they grow so tall. That's and true. then he can just go out there and pluck them. Um, that is one of his favorite things to do. So I'll make sure to have some of those in there, which is great. Well, that's a great point. Actually, if you've never grown tomatoes before, uh, cherry tomatoes are an easy yes. one to grow. I like the easiest crops you can do because as <laughs> I have been around for about three years in the gardening world, um, I'm still a novice. And so I like to focus on flowers that grow up pretty quick and then smaller vegetables that I can take right out of the garden and just put them right. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for me, I've been gardening for a little bit longer. So uh, I really love a challenge. Yes, and I go for every question I go to Rebecca. <laughs> and sometimes she, um, I don't want to say gardens too much because you can't. <laughs> That's um, not possible. No, but yeah. she does garden a lot. And then she'll bring in all the extra stuff to work and everyone will just kind of swipe them. And she'll be there telling us like, do this to this plant and this plant and this plant. And we yeah. all kind of like exchange, which is so fun at work. Well, I think that's actually one of the fun parts about gardening is the community aspect of it. So whether you're giving away extra seedlings that you might have grown or giving away the harvest if you mm -hmm. grow vegetables or, you know, really just walking by your, your house or your apartment that has a window box and being able to see those, those flowers, you're, yes. you're actually giving something to somebody else. I yeah. think it's a really wonderful thing. Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah. And also, I like to go to Rebecca when um, I mess something up because Gardening is such a great learning hobby and there will be something every year that you excel at and then something where you're like, well, I'm going to definitely never do that again. Um, <laughs> so I will bring up and be like, what did I do? And I think that that's a super important part of the gardening community as well, because I find it's just a really helpful community and that's everyone true. understands that we're all starting from somewhere. And yeah. I think that that's important. And even if you're a master gardener who's gone to school for this, uh, there's always something to learn. I and mean, yes. that's the beauty of it, too. There's endless things to grow, endless things to learn about, endless mm -hmm. things to do. And there's new varieties that come out yeah. all the time. I'm sorry. Spring is just exciting. <laughs> and I feel like we should all be excited about Absolutely. It. <laughs> absolutely. The other thing I really love is to plant containers on my patio. Yes. So unlike you, I'm not, I'm not a huge flower gardener, but I love container gardening mm -hmm. because I can create a little oasis outside and it's where I like to go and relax mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the summer and and just enjoy the beauty yep. watch the pollinators bees are buzzing yeah yeah, yeah. so best. creating that little environment is really wonderful and we'll share with you a little bit later today our new plantlings program yes yes which are baby seedlings that are shipped to you directly they are adorable spoiler alert it's they great. are they are and they're great for container gardeners or planting into garden beds yeah Yes. And don't forget, we have a 15% off on our website for all viewers. Um, there's a discount code on there. Just go on there and uh, stock up for the season. Yes. So fairymorse.com. And today, again, we're having our live uh, garden get together, first annual Fairy Morse garden get together. So thank you so much again for joining us today. And it's the first day of spring, which is so exciting. And we're meeting today with different guests from around the country to share what they're working on in their gardens today. Which is actually important to note that where you're gardening is, is important and it can change based on where you are in the country. So we're trying to talk to people from multiple different regions to see where you guys are. Yeah. And a little bit later today, we'll share with you some new tools that we're launching on fairymorse.com that'll help you understand what are the right plants to grow in your personal area. It's called Garden Matchmaker. It's a tool that we're introducing later today. So I think it's time to go to our next guest. Uh, we'd love for you to meet Fanny Liao, who is joining us from Southern California. So she's already feeling that nice warm weather on this first day of spring. So again, Jealous. Fanny, I know, <laughs> Fanny Liao from Fans in the Garden. Take, Take it
Thank you, Rebecca and Tracy, for the awesome kickoff. I'm very excited to be here today to talk about Fairy Moors, Jiffy, and Seed Starting. My name is Fanny. I garden here in Zone 10B in Southern California. I am the gardener behind the Instagram account, Fans in the Garden. If you've been following, thank you very much. So let's get into it. So what seeds am I starting now in mid-March? I am doing summer winter squash, cucumbers, beans, lots of herbs, lots of flowers, and possibly a second round of tomatoes. Well, what happened to your first round of tomatoes? Uh, well, here in Southern California, we can actually start our tomato, pepper, and eggplant seeds as early as January. Starting them indoors gives us a head start so that once our nighttime temperature reaches a 60 degrees consistently, we can get those seedlings out. Now it's even more important for colder climates, um, gardeners to start indoors because you have a shorter growing season. And so you want your crop to mature and ripen before your next frost. Now, how do you check your frost date? Well, go online and enter your zip code and check when um, your last frost date would be. And then you just count backwards to see when you should start your seeds indoors. Now, what type of growing medium do I use? Well, Jiffy offers a couple of different options. Um, what I have used when I first started gardening and what I think is um, easiest is their peat pellets. Now you can start them um, in a tray such as these, the 10, 20 trays. Jiffy actually has them um, in different sizes. It comes with a dome. Um, you can start those in, in a tray like this if you're doing a big batch. If you are doing just a few because you don't have that much time, you can actually get individual ones. Um, this is the large, this is the medium, and this is the small. So you want to put them in a tray and add warm water. Warm water is very important because if you put cold water, it actually does not expand as quickly. So you want to put warm water let it soak for a few minutes and it's gonna expand and then you can sow your seeds. Now they also offer a pre-made seed starting mix that I have here. And you'll need um, Jiffy Pots, three inch or five inch, depending on where you're trying to sow, or these strips. I'm going to show you what I need to sow in these. So with the seed starting mix, you want to make sure it's pre-moistened. Um, you don't want it soggy, so make sure it's not dripping water. It should hold its shape when you crumble it. This It's kind of like a crumbly brownie mix. So you just want to fill your pots. Okay. Depending on what you want to sew, you could do the three inch or you can do the five inch. I'm going to do my pumpkins in this five inch so that I won't have to up pot it once it's big. And then these, I think I'm going to do cucumber. Now with the strips, you can do herbs, you can do flowers. Um, whatever um, is a smaller crop you can use these strips now what i like about these is they're biodegradable and so you can kind of just rip out a section right here plant it in soil and it's gonna and roots are just gonna come out of it oopsie now these are ready maybe a little bit more for the big one so what am i sewing now Let's go with pumpkin, big one. Now I have, I want to show you these pumpkin seeds here. So some seeds you actually want to soak it overnight or at least a few hours. Those seeds include corn, um, beans, some uh, squashes, and that's because you want, okay, see this here, the skin is, breaking apart so that the seed can pop up easily. Easily, It's easier to sprout this way. So beans, now let me just find my pumpkin seeds. 
Now, how deep do you sow the seeds? Well, it depends on what you're trying to grow. Um, some will call for just sowing on top of the surface of the soil, lightly cover it. Some will say quarter inch, some as deep as one inch. It really just depends on what you're trying to grow. So always check the seed packets instructions. Okay, and then here, cucumber seeds. Now, how many seeds do you want to sow? Well, it really depends. You should at least do three to four, but if it's a rare seed and you only have a few, you know, what can you do? Just one or two in each pot or each pea pellet. Okay, and then look, it's fully expanded. And you just want to put them in your tray and add your seeds. Now for the smaller pea pellets, I like to use them for herbs and flowers. Um, because once they are big enough to transplant out, I could just remove the netting and I could just plant the whole thing. And it's important that you remove the netting because it does restrict some of the roots if the roots are big. Okay. Now, you definitely want to use a dome. And also, a heat map. So why is it important? Well, you're mimicking conditions um, that are most favorable for the seeds to start. So you want to use a heat mat, put your tray on top, put the dome on top, and this is the reason why. I started these seeds three days ago and it's already sprouting because I put this tray on top of a heat mat and then I had the dome on top keeping the moisture in there. And that's gonna help the seeds sprout, germinate as soon as possible. Um, versus, you know, the few days to a couple of weeks more that it's going to take. So um, once the seeds sprout, what do you do? Well, once it sprouts, let's say like this one here, there's two, there's two seedlings, there's two sprouts there. What do you do? Well, you definitely want to thin to one so that the stronger one is not competing for nutrition. Um, so you want to just take a little scissor, a little snip, and snip that off. Pick the one that's the healthiest. There you go. So when you're sowing a pack of seeds like this, when do you take the dome off? Well, you take the dome off when 50% of the seeds have germinated. Um, otherwise, you can keep the dome on, and it's going to help the rest of the seeds stay warm, keep the moisture in good to go. Um, and so when do you fertilize? Well, it really depends. But what I like to do is once it has two sets of true leaves, um, that's when I dilute a liquid fertilizer, um, I use half strength, and then um, I water from the bottom, you always want to water from the bottom because you don't want any issues with damping off, you don't want, you know, fungus gnats and uh, nasty things to grow on top of this uh, of the pea. So you definitely want to bottom water. Now, when seeds are big enough, and you see roots coming through, well, they are big enough to up pot now, if you are not ready to transplant them out yet. Um, that's why it's also good to have one of these um, three inch or five inch pots because you can easily remove the netting here and you just pop it into um, a potting mix. You wouldn't use a seed starting mix anymore. You would use a potting mix. You pop it in and then you can wait a few more weeks until you, know, you can plant them out until your temperature is warm enough or until you have time to do it. So the last part I want to cover is hardening off. Hardening off just means that you're going to take your plants out to acclimate to the weather outside um, once it's ready. So how do you know it's ready? Well, like I said, if this, uh, if you're ready to transplant this out now, you can start hardening off now. 
Um, what it just means is that you're taking your seeds out to, um, out to outside and it's, uh, it needs to just get used to being outdoors. Um, so you start off with taking it out for 30 minutes the first day and then another 30 minutes. Um, and then you just increase um, the time you know, throughout the week. And by the end of the first week, you can transplant it out. Now, don't transplant out your seedlings in the middle of the day at noon. You definitely want to do it in the more early mornings or late afternoons so, so that once your plants are in ground, um, there's less of a chance of transplant shock um, or it's going to get burnt. So that's all the time I have now. I know it was super quick. So if you want to continue this conversation, follow me on Instagram. That's fans in the garden, F-A-N-S uh, in the garden. And we can continue this conversation there. So otherwise, remember to follow all the other speakers and back to the studio. Thank you so much, Fanny. It was so fun to see all the great things that you're growing this season. That's super exciting. Well, for those of you just joining in, you're joining us live on the first day of spring for the first annual Ferry Morse Garden Get Together. We're super excited to be here with you today. <laughs> and as a perk for you, anyone watching today, there's a promo code that you can utilize that's for a limited time. So definitely take advantage of that. Yes, and that's on fairymorse.com. Yes, absolutely. So we got to see a little bit about Fanny's doing with growing seeds. And I know Tracy, you started some seeds recently. Yes. Why don't you share what you've been up to? Yeah. So the thing about seeds that I love um, as I use them at work um, <laughs> is I'm constantly growing stuff. And it's so amazing to see things that come up really quick versus not. And just understand that like all of these seedlings that we grew um, were started on March 1st. And it's so important to note that marigolds and basil and the zucchini they, they're all going to grow at different rates and that's really the fun part about seed starting is knowing that like you grew all these and they're going to go out at different times or like fanny was using one of our seed starting trays this is one of our jiffy um seed starting trays and these are two different varieties of cucumbers and even though they're both cucumbers they're going to grow at a different rate and um that's just an exciting thing about crops because you know, when you put stuff outside versus where you live. And well, it's something to think about too, when you're starting seeds. So this is one of our, our Jiffy seed starting trays right here. And when you're growing multiple seed types in the same tray, you actually want to make sure you're looking at the back of your seed packet to yes. see how long it will take for the seeds to germinate so that you put seeds that will germinate in about the same amount of time in the same tray. And what does germination mean in case we're starting from scratch, which oh, is fair? Yeah, that's a great question. So really it means when the seed is sprouts from that, the actual plant sprout sprouts from the seed. So you'll mm -hmm. start to see like this guy just germinated, if you can see that. I like to say when you see green, pop the top. That's a good way to think about it. <laughs> it's definitely a good way to think about it. I like it. to start. So yes, you want to make sure that you're planting uh, seed types that have the same time to germinate yes. so that uh, they're popping up at the same time. You can take off the humidity dome at the same time, mm -hmm. give it some light at the same time, and they'll all be happy seeds living in harmony together. Yes, <laughs> but not everyone wants to start from seeds and that's fair. Yep. Um, so at Fairy Morse, we offer a couple other solutions. We do, we have a program called Plantlings, which is live baby plants uh, that go direct from our nursery straight to your door. And they come just like this. Yeah, you'll receive a package just like this. So the roots are nice and protected and nestled. And you just simply, oh, that's lavender. Now, this is one of my favorites. I could smell that as soon as you open, open the case. They smell great even before they flower, which is wonderful. And of course, obviously, once they flower, they smell even better. Yes. But so Tracy, I think, is going to take us through how to plant plantlings. And this is one of our self-watering pots here. Now, something to think about um, if you've never used a self-watering pot, it's actually a really great investment because it takes the guesswork out of watering. And especially if you're you're into using container plants like I am, you know, maybe you uh, forget one day to water or you're, you're gone for a weekend. Uh, you're you, allowed to still have a life when you're gardening. You I know are. it's sad to say, well, but it becomes part of your life. There are other things that you should be doing as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the self-watering takes the, sort of the guesswork out of that watering piece of it and uh, you know, automatically gives the plants the water that they need. And so Tracy has just rehydrated this soil. This is basically a compressed version of our young plant soil. Um, but I think important thing to remember when you're when you're 
transplanting either plantlings or any type of seedling or even a further outgrown transplant, uh, you really want to make sure that you're moisturizing, you're adding water to that soil before you plant. What happens if you put it in dry soil? Because some of us just take it right out of the bag. Yeah. So if you plant something in dry soil, that soil is going to want to suck the water right out of the plant. So it's actually the exact opposite of what you want to happen <laughs> when you want to make sure, you know, the most important time to water your plants, by the way, is right after transplanting. That's when they're yes. really vulnerable and you want to make sure that you give them the most care that you can at that point. So starting with, you know, if you have a container, making sure that the soil is moistened before you plant. If we're talking about a garden bed, then in that case, you want to make sure that you irrigate or you take your garden hose, et cetera, and make sure that it's got a, a nice moist uh, area of soil that you're planting in. And then once you plant, you want to add more water just to make sure that it's got what it's what it needs. So some people use gloves. I do not ever, <laughs> but more power to you if you do. Um, so what I normally do when I do plantlings is I try to figure out how big is the plant going to get? Because in an ideal world, you plant it and then it grows. So even though these are adorable right now, um, they will get bigger, which is really the key. Um, <laughs> So say you get like three of them, how many would you put in this size container? Yeah. I mean, it, there is some variation between plant, but you can get away with a lot in a container. You can plant pretty tightly in a container because you're really just looking for a one season show of flowers. If you're thinking about a garden bed where you're planting in the ground, you really want to follow those directions on your on your seed packet or uh, on, the, on the plantlings uh, description to make sure that it has enough room to grow over time. But if you're planting in a container and your intent is really just to have it grow for one season, you can plant them, you know, about three to four inches apart and get away with that for one season. Again, garden bed in the ground, you want to make sure that it gives room to grow over time. Mm. I constantly over seed my garden. And then around like August, I'm just going through and try, <laughs> trying to salvage the plants that are still Yes. Still working in there because we well, just get really excited. Well, and, and I think it, that's actually an important point, right? It's okay over time to thin things if they've grown too closely together or even your seedlings here. So see these seedlings? So the basil and tomato plants, we have more than one seedling coming up. It's perfectly fine and, in fact, advisable to pinch them off at the bottom. Yes, and don't save. rip them out from the root. I do this every year. <laughs> and then what happens is, is if you just go to rip the extra seedling out, it might rip the one that you actually want to keep. So you want to just kind of like nip it at the soil. Yeah, you level. just want to take scissors or, or snippers and, or, and yeah, yep, yeah, exactly like that. Take it off the surface and you want to save the very best one. So it, it feels like terrible. You just grew these yeah. brand new things, but um, it's actually important that you give the strongest one the ability to grow and don't take away the nutrients and the water that it needs. Right. So it's perfectly fine to do that. There you go. And now as you're he's happy. Yeah. And as you grow things into mature plants, same thing. You might need to thin things down over time. That's okay. You might need to divide things and move them. That's okay. Just be proud of yourself for growing the three <laughs> seedlings. You did it. Absolutely. Um, but you really only need one. So yeah. <laughs> good job. So now Tracy has planted three lavender. And the mm. thing about lavender is it tends to get tall and spiky. And um, so that's really nice for a center of an arrangement. Mm -hmm. So you might have heard uh, thrill, fill, and spill before. Yes. Thrill means something that's tall. Fill is something that has more body and is sort like of mid height. Like foliage, right? Like that yeah, kind foliage. of like thing. And then spill is something that's going to cascade over. And what is this adorable thing? Okay, so this is, I think, one of the best kept secrets of container gardening, which is strawberries. Strawberries, why, you might say? Well, because strawberries have uh, basically two huge benefits. One is, of course, they produce delicious, tasty fruits. But the second is they also produce really pretty flowers. And so they have this trailing or cascading habit. Um, so you can put them in a, in a container with flowers and they'll grow over and they'll create pretty flowers in pink and, and fuchsia colors yes. and then eventually produce fruits there as well. So they're a fun one to grow in container plants. And in this case, this is a hanging basket. So you can kind of imagine this cascade of strawberries and flowers uh, spilling Sounds down great. over this. Um, and then we also, we have these baby plantlings, which are adorable, um, and I love getting them. But then we have a new thing this year, if you want to go that extra step. Yes. So we have just launched Plantlings Plus. So if you think of plantlings as our little babies, these are the tweens. <laughs> Without the attitude, which Without is attitude. super important. Yeah, they don't talk back, so they're wonderful. <laughs> um, so this essentially is in a four-inch pot size. So you can choose from, depending on uh, what's how much time you have or uh, how confident you feel in gardening, you can either go for the babies 
or you can go for the tweens. And these have been grown out a little bit further for you. Yeah. But the root ball is still all intact and it comes nice and safely delivered. And you can just pluck it out of the pot and put it right in the ground, depending on when your last frost date is. Or you can keep them inside, keep them under a grow light, keep them happy until your frost date arrives. Absolutely. Um, the thing that I love about the Plantlings Plus and Plantlings is that um, my favorite thing is houseplants, and we offer houseplants now. What houseplants do we offer? We do. We offer a number of houseplants in this Plantlings Plus size, so everything from spider plants to succulents. So there's a lot of interesting things for you to peruse today and use that 15% off discount code. Yeah. Uh, but also we have, ta-da! flowering shrubs. So we yes. have azaleas, we have hydrangeas, mm -hmm. we have Japanese maples, we have dogwood trees. So a lot of really fun stuff beyond. It's just so cool to expand the line yeah. like into these bigger things. And every year, hopefully we add more that I can yes. take home from work. Yes. Um, this <laughs> ivy is super important because it, while you can put it outside and that's probably where most people would put it, I actually have this Plantlings Plus Ivy growing on my kitchen cabinets and it trails down. Um, the kitchen is becoming a jungle, which to each their own. So. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's benefits to gardening indoors too, like air quality. So, yes. um, and of course the visual beauty too. So I wouldn't feel uh, too sad about the fact that you've got a ton of my plants. Husband. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, no, it grew from seed. I got it from work. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. It's a game we play, which is great. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we have, again, new size Plantlings Plus, and we've expanded into trees, flowering shrubs, and indoor plants, as well as, of course, our flowers and vegetables as well. So I think it's about time to go to our next guest. Awesome. And so let me introduce you to Pamela Reed. And she is based in New York City, the borough of Brooklyn. So she is Brooklyn Farm Girl. So and we have some people checking in from New York and New oh, Jersey great. and Michigan. I'm so happy to see all these people all throughout the country. Yes. So let's take it over to Pamela to learn more about urban gardening. Hey, I'm Pamela from Brooklyn Farm Girl and welcome to Brooklyn. I'm really excited to be here with you to get you excited about spring gardening because I'm pretty excited about gardening too. These plants need to get outside. And I know if you live in the Northeast, probably like earlier this week, you were like, this still feels like winter, right? But fingers crossed, spring is coming. So just a little bit about me, I'm Pamela, um, and I've been a urban city gardener for almost 20 years now. Um, we, me, my husband, my family, we've grown in kind of every situation from indoors to not having any space outdoors. Um, to fully being part of a lovely community garden now. Um, and I'm really here to talk about and to encourage and excite urban gardening, no matter how small your space is, even if you don't have a space, even if you just have a little spot on your windowsill. Get that cilantro growing, girl. Get that basil growing. You can really grow so much in a small space, no matter if you live in a city, Matter if you don't have a backyard, no one has a backyard, come on. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about growing in small spaces and hopefully that gets you excited to get out there and start growing your own food if you live in a urban environment. Um, a little bit about kind of all the years that we've been growing. So in the very beginning, we started growing on our rooftop. Our apartment building has this massive roof and if you go up to the rooftops in a city, you'll realize that they're not used for anything. Could you imagine if all those spaces were green spaces? Like how amazing would that be, right? So like every gardening adventure starts, I'm sure you know, it starts out with a few pots, right? You're like, I'm gonna grow a pepper plant. I'm gonna grow a cucumber plant. I'm gonna grow some herbs. And then like two years later, you have like, a cornfield on, on your roof, right? So that's really um, how it was for us. And it really opened up the love of city gardening for us. Um, some little pros and cons of rooftop gardening, if maybe you wanna take that step. Um, first of all, just like right out the door here, um, get permission. If you don't own your building, um, get permission from your landlord. Make sure the roof is sturdy and safe. Okay. Um, once you got the go ahead, 
just like, just, just, just understand that you got to get all that stuff up there to the roof. It is, it is definitely for the love of gardening. I can't tell you how many times every spring we had to replenish um, these big garden beds that we made on the roof and just lugging all this potting mix and soil up to the roof. Also, don't forget that the rooftop gets really hot, right? So the plants are gonna get dry really quick up on the rooftop. What we, exper what we experimented in and really kind of fell in love with, and we still use this even in the community bed now, which is we started making sub irrigated planters, which are basically like big totes, big like plastic bins. Um, and they have a, um, like a wick system where the water goes to the bottom and then it rises and waters the roots. And so it waters from the bottom and goes to the top. And this ensures that your roots are always wet. They're always moist. They're not going to dry out. And we've had really great success with sub irrigated planters, um, on our rooftop. Cause like I said, it got really, really hot and really, really quick. So we did rooftop gardening for a while. And then we took like a two year hiatus where we were like, let's get a little place upstate New York and start growing up there only on the weekends because we didn't want to leave. We're like Brooklyn for life. And um, so we got this little place upstate, just land, no house, no anything. <laughs> and we just made this big garden. It was literally, we just bought land to garden on. And we would go up there for the weekends. We would drive up, we would just garden. We had this like big container that we would just sleep in at night. We would basically just camp. And then we would get back in a car on Sunday and we would drive back, back to Brooklyn. Really, like it was just about gardening for us. And that was really, really fun. And it was full of adventures that I'm so happy that my husband and I got to share together. It was a lot of hard work. It was, it was such fun. But we realized that we really loved spending time in the city, gardening in the city. Like our heart was with urban gardening. We liked the challenge, the challenge of growing in the city. We also had kids and that made it a little hard to grow up on the weekend. <laughs> so we came back to the city and then we got part of our local neighborhood community garden. And that's pretty much changed everything. If you, are thinking about becoming a part of a community garden, do it. It is such an amazing space to be part of. It is, it is like the coolest thing in the summer to have all these people just in the garden growing, all these interesting vegetables and plants, the things that I've never heard of. And, you know, a woman will come over to me and show me these squashes that I've never seen. And ways to cook them and then she'll like go pick some for me and give them to me and then i'll find something from my bed and i'll give them to her it is just it is so cool and i know that community um gardens are a hot ticket i know they're hard to get part of i'm constantly asked how do i join the community garden there's like a hundred person wait list i know step one get on the wait list no matter like how long it is just join it right it's better to be on it now Two, even if you can't get a private space to grow in the community garden, ask them if you can just be part of the garden. Ask them if you can just show up on the weekends and help other people garden, help the compost people. Compost is awesome, all right? So like help the people with the flower beds or the herb beds or just, just become of that space, you know? Just, just become part of that community, even if you don't have a private bed because I can also tell you that if you are there every Saturday helping out, people are going to give you lots of vegetables. Like who doesn't like free vegetables, right? <laughs> All right. So, um, spring for us, like I said, it felt really, really cold a few weeks ago, a few days ago, actually. Um, but we have our spring vegetables ready to move outside. Uh, I have a list here of everything we're growing for spring. Again, I'm in, Brooklyn, so I am zone 7B, 7B represent. Um, this year we're growing onions. Um, you can see where their onions are. Oh, I didn't bring them over. Our onions are over there. We have kale. I love kale. It's my lunch every day. 
We got some broccoli, broccoli in the house back there. We got the Brussels sprouts right there and our cabbage. We also are growing peas, carrots, and then um, in early May, we also um, plant our um, potatoes. So that is our list of spring vegetables. And um, I'm really excited and my family is so excited. We have two daughters, um, Enceladus and Proxima. We like space. And um, it is, it makes me so happy to have these two city kids. They are the definition of city kids, but they know because they've been at the garden literally since they've, I've been wearing them as a baby and they know where their food comes from. My oldest can tell you how to grow a Brussels sprout. Like you would not, she goes into details. She helps me dig up the potatoes every August. It's just, it's so cool for her to just show up pick some peas, go to the table, prepare like her little snack. It's just, it's just so cool to have that space. And I feel so lucky that I am able to have a family in the city, but still, still have that feeling, that connection to nature, to growing their own food, to getting their hands dirty. My kids are filthy every weekend from soil. Like their, their, their clothing, their face has mud on it, their nails and I love that. I love that we can go to the garden on the weekend and just dig stuff up, plant stuff. And my kids get to be part of seeing from seed to the table because I also love cooking. Brooklyn Farm Girl. <laughs> All right, so um, one last thing I wanted to show you guys before I head out was um, the products that I use to start everything from seed indoors. So. Everything we grow, we start from seed. And that's done for two reasons. One, it's lots of fun. It's lots of fun growing from seed. Um, but two, it's budget friendly. You know, like this packet of key cucumbers here, $1.99. Like you know how much if you went to a greenhouse and bought like a pack of 12 plants would cost, right? So when you're growing, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, you do you, things. Um, you can imagine how pricey it can get, so seeds. So what I like to use, is the Jiffy Greenhouse. And um, they, these come with like these, these, these little pelts already. But you can also fill this up with potting mix. I just drop the seeds in. Step one, decide what you want to grow and how many. That is the hardest, that is the hardest choice, right? Should I grow 20 kale plants or should I grow 48 kale plants? 48, right? It's always 48. <laughs> so decide what you want to grow, how many, and it's as easy as if you're going to use potting mix in one of these greenhouses, just fill it up, poke holes, and then put seeds in. We like to use the green the greenhouse lid that this comes with, put it on top. Now here's the secret to getting amazing plants from seeds. And we do this all the time and we pretty much have like a 100% germination rate for our seeds. And I'm really proud of that because it's take a lot of work. But we started using a heat mat um, a few years ago, and it's just changed how we grow from seed. Um, it just the seeds, just having the mat improves the process from the seeds and from the very beginning so well. Um, within like two or three days, the seeds pop up, and you'll see your little seedling um, so quickly. So after we put the greenhouse lid on this. Then we put it on a heat mat. We have a bunch of heat mats because we have so many plants growing and we use it. So I would definitely, if you're starting to grow from seed and you haven't been using a heat mat, get yourself one or a couple. And then um, like maybe like a month, a month and a half later. Um, so like these plants there and these plants there and these plants there, they need bigger homes. You can see they're like growing out of their homes and they're ready to move outdoors. So what I will do is I will fill up um, these little peat pots with, with a mix and I will just pick these out, plant them one by one, and then they're ready to move outside. So those are products that I use. I'm really, really excited to get growing for the summer, the spring. There'll be lots of tomatoes and you can see I got my favorite tomatoes here. Jelly bean tomatoes, try them if you haven't. Um, but I really hope that you liked this little thing. <laughs> um, and if you want to learn more about city growing, um, check out me, 
Brooklyn Farm Girl. I'm on all the socials, so check me out. Um, also, just drop a comment. Um, is it down below? Is it to the side? I don't know. You can figure it out. But let me know what you're growing the spring and the summer. And um, yeah, it was really nice to spend some time with you. Fingers crossed. Spring is coming. I promise. All right. Bye. Thank you so much, Pamela. And by the way, that was just such a good reminder of, you know, you don't have to have a one acre plot of land to be a gardener. Anybody can be a gardener. If you're living in a studio apartment and you're growing a single house plant and you're taking care of that house plant, then you are a gardener. There's something sort of, I think, intimidating about the word gardener. Yes. Everyone, it's one of those hobbies where people say, I garden, but I'm not a gardener. And it's like, but you are though. <laughs> yeah. So be proud. You're yeah. a gardener. That's awesome. If you're growing, you know, one crocus from a bulb in your front yard, <laughs> you are a gardener. Yes. And that's a wonderful thing. Yes. Yes. So we're really excited. Um, again, this is the first day of spring and you are here live with us for the first annual Barry Morris Garden Get Together. And I'm Rebecca Sears. And I'm Tracy Jen. And it's so great to be here with you today. And remember, as a perk of watching, you get a special discount that's available for a limited time. So check us out on fairymorse.com and you'll have all the information there about the discount and more. You can stock up on all your spring gardening needs because spring is the most exciting month. Yes. And while you're there on fairymorse.com, you should absolutely sign up for our new rewards program. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We just launched this program and it's free. Free is good. Yes. And just for signing up, you get benefits and perks. Just for signing <laughs> up, you get free shipping on seed only orders. That's awesome. And I signed up the other day and I posted on Instagram and I got points. I put my birthday in and I got points. Having points for existing is just key, honestly. <laughs> yes. Just well, exist. <laughs> we love gardeners. We want to make sure that you're happy. We want you to be successful and we want you to keep on gardening because it's such a wonderful thing. Yes. Gardening is uh, fantastic in many ways. Not only are you producing beautiful plants or vegetables that you can eat. And by the way, once you start growing tomatoes, you will never buy another supermar supermarket tomato again. It's true. It is true. But you know, there's other benefits too. So you might not realize this, but there's actually mental health benefits to gardening. It's a de-stressor. There's, of course, it's great exercise too. Yeah. It gets you outside. And so I know- So much bending, really. Yeah. It's just a bending thing. That's true. But I don't know about you, but after being inside for the past two and a half odd yes. years- Any excuse to get outside and you get to grow things is the best. Absolutely, absolutely. So enjoy the rewards program. It is available to you now, free of charge on fairymorse.com. Mm -hmm. And with that, we are launching something else exciting this week. Oh, yes. So we have a new matchmaker quiz because a lot of people start gardening and they don't really know where to start. Hopefully, you've gotten some tips today. Um, but to have something that helps you know uh, what you should be doing in your area. So what are some of the questions that we would learn on the quiz? Yeah. So the, the garden matchmaker essentially walks you through a number of questions, starting from what do you like to garden? How comfortable are you gardening? Where do you live? And then all this information basically gives you an output of what types of plants should you grow to be most successful in your particular area and with your level of comfort. Mm -hmm. It'll also give you in your profile a number of articles that are most appropriate to what you're trying to learn or most appropriate to where you are in that gardening journey. So it'll hopefully save you some time and what you would normally research and spend a lot of time looking uh, to answer questions that you might have, as well as save you some heartache by giving you <laughs> we best... only want to give you stuff that works yes and gardening is the kind of hobby that you learn every single year every year you're going to find stuff that worked for you or didn't work for you and you can um learn more as you go it's kind of the best hobby in that way yes it's it, gardening is absolutely a journey it's a learning process it's intellectually stimulating it's also great physically for too yeah i garden with my kids at home and to show them that you can have a seed that grows into a plant and the plant is something that you eat and then what do you do like throughout the other seasons like for parents it's just ideal yeah there's is there's something really truly magical about gardening yeah. and so our goal at fairymores.com is to help you be more successful as a gardener so check out our garden matchmaker quiz that's launching the end of this week mm -hmm. i love that we have all this new stuff coming there's new tools there's new digital tools there's new hand tools there's new that's all right. sorts of stuff and we're just yes. growing every year yes absolutely well that brings us to the last guest of the day. Yay. So joining us from Texas is Marcus Bridgewater, the personality behind Garden Marcus, and he's launching a new book next month too, which is very awesome. exciting. So Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. 
Oh, God, thank you so much for having me. Uh, hello, everybody, and happy first day of spring. Uh, again, thank you so much, Ferry Morris. It is a pleasure and a half to join you guys today for the first garden get together. Um, there are a lot of joys that come from gardening, as you all were saying, and um, a lot of that for me comes in the essence of watching things grow. And while I watch things grow, I'm reminded that I myself am wanting to grow and am striving to grow. And so uh, within that ethos, uh, the garden provides endless lessons. Um, it provides endless joys. There are smells, there are colors, there are sights, there are so many things to engage with when it comes to the garden. And as my uh, journey of gardening, so to say, has taken root, I find myself constantly mystified in the garden. Despite having uh, crossed thousands of plants at this point, having lost hundreds, having nurtured back hundreds, um, I am still seeing new things every day. And that uh, has struck me as um, really important to note because the versatility of plants uh, can be easily underappreciated. But the more we stop to appreciate it, the more we grow ourselves. And again, that's really rooted in the endless learning. Um, I have a dichotomy that I share with everyone. It's lesson versus barrier. And in the garden, we are presented with the opportunity to learn tons of lessons. And every experience that we learn a lesson from brings us more peace as we go forward. But at the exact same time, there is a choice being made. We also could turn that same experience into a barrier and call ourselves a bad gardener. And now we're bad gardeners and now we try and avoid gardening. We're not learning any lesson. And guess what? We're getting further away from peace. So I see gardening as a real opportunity to engage with life and to better myself mentally, physically, and spiritually. Um, and so, so much of this is done through the experimenting of the garden and through trying new things, through learning, through that experimentation. Again, if you are new to gardening, then I really think that the first step you should take is to just go get a plant and, and start engaging with the relationships with the plant. If you are an experienced gardener, but you have lost touch with the joy of gardening, then I encourage you to stop for a moment, take a deep breath and look at the plants objectively. Um, so often because of the battle going on between life and the world, the world turns this great entity that is plants into a commodity that we must consume. And now we've got to produce. I've got to worry about whether or not it's growing or it's not growing. Am I giving it the right nutrients? And we start thinking about the reward before we think about the process. And we think about how much we can learn as we go down the process. And so to me, that's why I use gardening as a, as a chance to experiment. Um, I have lost lots of plants in my experiments, but I've learned in uh, quantible amounts of information in those same experiments. Um, and I, I, I encourage you all to experiment just because you never know what you're going to learn when you start going down the pathway of challenging yourself to try new things. And sure, there have been a lot of times where I've read, and again, I'm from zone 9B, held to the zone 9B. Uh, there have been a lot of times where I've read something that said, oh, it's not gonna grow here in zone 9B. And I've thought, wow, okay, but why? After research and seeing that it's about the temperatures and about where the ger uh, germination state's going to come from, uh, where the pollinators come from, I start to think to myself, are there ways that I can circumvent those things with the experimentations? And again, it has taken my experience 
in directions that are so vast that I would never have thought I would cross. And a lot of that is because we are challenged by nature. Every day, nature and um, all of the, the challenges that come with consuming resources make for an incredibly intense experience for most of us when we try to start out. It becomes daunting. But again, the more we face these challenges with the lesson versus barrier, the more we face these challenges and see the opportunity in front of us, the more it opens up a world that seems to be infinite. Um, and I love planting seeds. I love the idea of planting seeds because every seed is a unique plant in itself. Every seed has the potential to yield multiple leaves, multiple flowers, uh, multiple kinds of fruit. But not every seed will grow. So it takes effort to make sure that we are monitoring our seeds and it takes attention, it takes a kind of awareness. Again, that can feel daunting. But if you take it slowly and you make it about the connection between you and whatever it is that's growing, you start to see things very differently. And all of a sudden, it starts to stop being as daunting as it is an opportunity. I see every seed as a metaphor for choice. And I will plant this seed as I discuss that choice. Every seed can grow something if it is in the right environment, if it's taken care of. Many of us don't think about how our choices that we make every day are similar to seeds. If we think about the seed to choice, then we start to be conscious about our choices. So as I plant this seed, I'm going to plant it with the idea of, of love, kindness, patience, and positivity. So as its roots grow, they will yield wholesome roots that will give us trees of prosperity, yielding fruits of success. And the more I think about planting seeds in that fashion, the more I am conscious of the choices I make, the more I am conscious of the fruits we are to yield in our future. We can learn so much about gardening and at the exact same time, we can learn so much about ourselves. Learning about ourselves through gardening helps us not only sustain the connection between us and the plants, but it also, again, helps us better our well-being. When I look at the plant and I'm reminded that the plant has to have a specific kind of soil, it wants to grow in a specific zone, it needs a certain amount of light and a certain amount of water, I'm reminded that I too am a living creature that needs to be nourished and maintenance regularly. I have to be conscious of the choices I make because they are going to influence my growth. I also am affected by who I grow around and where I grow. As I embrace these lessons that I learned from the garden, I become a better person and I also become a more attentive gardener. Everything that we learn in the garden can be applied to life at large. And it can be used to better our communities and our environments. So I think it's really important that we all stop for a moment and take the time to think about the seeds that we plant and that those seeds represent the trees of our future. Uh, if you would like to know more about what uh, I do, you can check out any of my social medias. Um, 
You can check out TikTok and uh, you can check out TikTok at Garden Marcus. You can check out Instagram at Garden underscore Marcus. Um, thank you again so much, Ferry Morris, for having me. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and I wish you the best with gardening this spring. Back to you, Ferry Morris. Thank you so much, Marcus. That was so inspiring as always. We really appreciate you being here with us today. And for those of you just joining in, you are joining us live for the first annual Ferry Morse Garden Get Together. So thanks for joining us today. And that was so fun. It was super fun. <laughs> and by the way, take advantage of the special perk for joining us today. We have a special discount just for joining today, 15% off. Go to ferrymorse.com to learn more and it's available for a limited time. So thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you are enjoying the very first day of spring for 2022. We're excited about we gardening. Yes. yes, we can't wait to get our hands in the dirt. We hope you will join us. Thank you so much for joining today, everyone, and happy spring. <laughs>